Uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce uh, Stephen Abrams. Stephen is here joining us. He's um, from Harvard Library. He's the uh, head of digital preservation there. And he has um, agreed to go ahead and put together a presentation about the DRS Futures Project at Harvard, which is a major, major project there to re-envision um, their digital repository service. So Stephen, thanks for sharing your screen out. And um, I'll hand it over to you. OK, great. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to somewhat, well, I want to apologize, but I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, say that what we're presenting, there's there's a lot of information um, kind of packed into a short presentation. Um, uh, there's not going to be near enough time to go into any of the real detail. Um, those of you who will be attending IPRES uh, later in the year, uh, we have a paper that's basically covering the same material and going into a bit more depth um, even that, there's a page limit, so um, there's actually going to be a lot more information that we'll be putting up on our project website um, throughout the, the remainder of the summer um, that's going to go into um, uh, talking about um, some of the more theoretical and conceptual aspects of what I'll be talking about here today. Um, I also have some other, other publications that um, are referring to a number of these same key things. Um, as Eric mentioned, uh, I asked, I'm Stephen Abrams. I'm head of the Digital Preservation Program for the Harvard Library. Um, Harvard has been involved in actively involved in uh, digital preservation activities for going on around 25 years now. Um, I was lucky enough to have been there, not quite at the beginning, but uh, I first came to the Harvard Library, I think, in 1999. Um, spent about 10 years there and I went off uh, to California um, where I was a colleague of Eric's at CDL for 11 years and then uh, I've been back now at Harvard for uh, going on four years. Um, so there's a lot of history here uh, at the Harvard Library. Um, digital preservation is, is basically seen as just the, the natural and organic continuation of the library's you know, historic mission uh, to steward the materials necessary for its research, teaching, and learning uh, operation. Um, just you know, continuation of that into the digital realm. Um, we still have a lot more tangible collections than we have digital um, by almost any measure, uh, but the rate of acquisition um, are certainly are very, very different. We are certainly acquiring digital materials at a much, much faster rate. Uh, then we're continuing to take on um, uh, analog stuff. Uh, as I said, we first started talking about preservation um, uh, sometime around 1998. Uh, and our uh, initial infrastructure for managing um, our, our assets uh, went into production in October of 2020. So we're coming up on 23 years of continual operation. Uh, in 1998, um, if you wanted something, you had to build it. Uh, you couldn't buy it. Uh, you couldn't download it. Uh, and that's what we did. Um, it was developed as a custom application uh, by our in-house IT staff. And 23 years later, it, it remains that. Um, and that is a bit of the crux of the problem, is it's uh, becoming increasingly unsupportable. Um, to try to build, uh, maintain, let alone enhance um, a system of this complexity uh, to meet our rapidly evolving needs. Um, at this point, we are managing um, about a little over 11 million objects. Uh, they were manifest by almost 900 million files um, and um, two petabytes, um, which we actually consider to be fairly modest in size compared to what we, we know it could be and we know what it, what it will be. Uh, there's a number of initiatives already in place, uh, particularly with regarding um, research data management and uh, mass digitization of our very extensive audiovisual uh, collections. Uh, media. Um, so in the next few years, we're anticipating anywhere from a two to five X growth. So we, we, we need something that's going to work better, uh, that is going to work uh, better at scale. Um, so that led to um, the DRS Futures Project, 
uh, which is a three-year effort that has is being uh, funded with with monies um, generously provided by by the university. We there's an internal uh, challenge grant program that we applied for, uh, and we were very happy that we were we were fully funded for everything that we wanted to do. Um, you might say, well, why is it going to take three years? Um, and it's because we are doing this in three phases. Uh, and it's this first key phase, I think, that is, is not always possible um, in, uh, in, in many instances, which is we're spending this whole first level of effort to imagine an ideal repository. What would we want if we had a blank sheet of paper or a blank whiteboard, maybe a better, a better metaphor? Um, at this point, not worrying about how we're going to do it. Uh, that, of course, critical activity is put off until the second phase um, that we'll be transitioning into um, sometime towards the uh, end of the summer, which is to plan an achievable repository, basically constraining uh, our ideal aspirations down to something we know we can actually uh, get to uh, in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of effort. Uh, and then, of course, uh, phase three is going to be um, deploying an operational repository. Uh, there's a lot more information about the project itself uh, at this uh, website, um, so please feel free to go there. Everything is open, uh, and we are periodically uh, updating the information set that's that's found there. So. Um, Let's talk about this, this first phase. This is something I, I felt very, very strongly about uh, that we really needed to do. And I was very gratified that we were able to make the case uh, and, uh, and, and get funding to actually spend a year uh, just doing blue sky exploration. Um, basically, I take the view that any, any sort of socio-technical undertaking um, it is almost impossible to ever exceed your expectations. Whatever you set as your expectation, that's that you're not going to go above that. So um, realizing that while we may not get everything we want uh, right away, um, there is no harm in setting those aspirations arbitrarily high. Um, that provides the framework for a, a longer term roadmap that you can start shipping away at um, and incrementally approaching uh, hopefully in a somewhat asymptotic manner. Um, if we kept our sights firmly on what we know how to do or know what the state of the art is today, I think we'd be missing out an opportunity. Um, this whole effort is, uh, we, we're viewing it as a, as, a, as a sort of a once in a generation uh, activity. We don't wanna have to do this in another five years or 10 years perhaps even. Uh, so again, we wanna set our sights really quite high. Um, now, in designing any kind of large-scale system such as this, there's a variety of um, steps that take place, but fundamentally, they sort of fall into preliminary, um, uh, what could be called ideational activities, uh, uh, where you're thinking and doing analysis, uh, so forth, hypothesizing, and at some point, you're going to switch over to a much more pragmatic set of activities of, uh, you know, leading to uh, procurement and, and deployment. Um, the point of critical transition from that ideational to pragmatic uh, level of effort, um, I think, is generally codified by a set of functional and non-functional requirements. That's the thing that, you know, is the result of that first phase and is the, is the initial uh, step for the second. Um, traditionally, uh, requirements are, um, are developed um, by what can be called an, an inductive uh, manner. Uh, basically, uh, by a, crush, uh, a process of synthesizing from the literature, uh, from stakeholder engagement, from consulting with peers, and so forth. Uh, but it's sort of a, a bottom-up approach. Um, and that's, of course, very, very useful, and we're, we're doing that. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, uh, artifacts of that, again, on, on the project website. But at the same time, I think it is useful to complement that kind of um, approach with one that is much more top-down, or uh, abductive. Um, abductive, apologize for the, for the philosophical term, um, is a form of logical inferencing. Um, so uh, in inductive logic basically is a way of saying, what is, what is the most probable uh, answer to a question? 
Uh, deductive, of course, is what is the logically necessary answer to a question. Uh, abductive is different slightly from both of those, which is what is the logically, uh, what is the best possible logical answer? So it, again, it lends itself to a very, very open-ended um, approach of starting from um, a small set of high-level axiomatic principles uh, and then trying to go through what are the logical implications of those principles um, and going from the top, top down uh, to you know, uh, adding additional, additional detail. Uh, ideally, these two approaches done in parallel will sort of overlap in the middle. Uh, and that in fact is, is in fact what we're sort of seeing. Um, but I think it's important to do both. Um, uh, in the inductive way of doing it, you are basically starting with sort of what you know, and you're 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 synthesizing that up into a high level set of things that you hope hopefully will cohere to cover the full range of the domain that's that's under examination. Um, the, in the inductive way of doing it, you start with sort of a high level synoptic view of that entire domain, and then you sort of very rigorously subdivided into little chunks. Um, so I, I always felt that that helped tends to ensure that you haven't forgotten anything because you're 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 iteratively refining things uh, from the top down. But as I say, you you would generally want to do both at the same time and then uh, merge everything back together. So what are those axiomatic principles? Um, again, going through this really, really quickly, um, but we start out with sort of a, a, a very bedrock um, uh, uh, a hypothesis uh, that digital preservation is not just about data management, which unfortunately is how it tends to be uh, talked about in the literature uh, and, and when we talk about things you know, uh, amongst ourselves. Um, and that makes sense because we're talking about what it is we're act we actually are doing. Um, but I think... Um, that's an important aspect of it, but it's that's really not the end goal. We're not just managing stuff. What we are really trying to do is facilitate human communication that is just happens to be taking uh, take, uh, unfolding across potentially extended time periods. That communication may be, and certainly in the modern age, is highly uh, technically mediated um, through you know the vehicle of you know of encoded digital objects. Uh, and through through the instrumentality of uh, various infrastructural systems, but at heart, it's about uh, human communication. We are connecting, um, you know, a past informative expression from a person uh, to the future uh, consumption of that expression by another person. Um, with that in mind, um, I think there are sort of three primary preservation imperatives um, that we deal with at a programmatic level uh, and that we're going to be asking our infrastructure to help us support. Um, first of all is um, an imperative to ensure persistent access to um, authentic information objects. Uh, again, some words to that effect are generally what you find in, um, in the various published definitions of what digital preservation is, uh, and it's not wrong. It just doesn't quite go far enough, I think. Um, to that, we need to wed um, some sort of assurance that we'll be able to provide persistent modalities of authoritative uh, uh, information um, uh, performances or behaviors, um, because I think we all recognize implicitly or explicitly uh, that you know we can't see bits. Um, all that digital stuff eventually has to get turned back into uh, some analog form um, that's susceptible to the human sensory apparatus. Um, and that, that um, you know, our objects are performed for us, uh, not always statically, sometimes that's, that's highly, uh, highly dynamic performance, a highly personalized performance. Um, and because of that notion of um, personalization, um, we also need to be concerned with uh, ensuring that we, there are persistent opportunities for legitimate information experiences. Um, uh, the experience that that future consumer is going to have with a preserved object um, is, in fact, um, conditional. Uh, it's contingent on time, place, person, and purpose. Uh, and therefore, it really uh, exists in a, in a subjective zone. Um, whereas, you know, dealing with um, authenticity, 
um, you can sort of look at that as 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 an objective determination. The thing the thing is is, is legitimate. You know, authentic or not, certainly the thing has integrity or not. That 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 should be an objective determination. Um, but which is, but we we contrast that with saying we want legitimate experiences by you know the the distinction between authenticity and legitimacy again is this like this objective subjective dichotomy. Uh, there there can be many many different legitimate experiences, and what's legitimate for you may not be legitimate for me, and vice versa. So anyway, these three imperatives sort of um, uh, uh, set the set the groundwork for for everything that we're doing. Um, so this slide is really busy, uh, and I'm not even going to attempt to really really dive into this. But this sort of sets out uh, at a very high level um, sort of the the underlying um, philosophical and conceptual foundation. Uh, and if we sort of Focus in just really briefly on some of these middle rows here. Um, this roads, for example, of affordance. Um, we can identify sort of seven key um, uh, bundlings of affordance or function, uh, depending on you know or, or semiotic dimension, whatever whatever sort of uh, terminology you're, you're familiar you're comfortable with. But we know we start out there that there there are uh, bits somewhere that are manifest on some sort of storage medium. Um, those bits are uh, is, a, is an encoded representation of some abstract information content um, that is also um, expressed in terms of some variety of rhetorical um, convention, all of which is supporting um, the underlying meaning. That meaning is revealed to us through a series of um, uh, performant, performant behaviors. Uh, those um, behaviors uh, are, of course, um, always interpreted in a particular context, an individual, an institutional, and a social context that is ultimately going to be leading us to um, appropriate or legitimate um, understanding. Uh, and I, I'm going to leave that there. Maybe we can come back to this at the discussion. I'm sure this is going to provoke some, some questions and so forth. Uh, and again, when we get to um, that paper I mentioned at IPRES, it goes into more detail about this. Um, using all of that, uh, all of that conceptual background, we have been deriving um, two um, abstract reference models: one functional, shown here, and an informational or data reference model. Uh, and we're using that term reference model very, very pointedly. Uh, this picture, this is not an architectural diagram. Um, it, it is uh, a reference model that is merely intended to show um, a, a very high level sense of, of functional capabilities and the high level um, associations uh, that might um, usefully per, um, persist between, between the various components. Um, so what we're showing here sort of in the middle in the darker gray is um, the core uh, repository infrastructure itself, which is sitting uh, in a, a wider ecosystem of digital library um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, the repository function we have sort of have, um, uh, broken up into five separate layers. Um, so there's a layer we're calling the console, uh, which is sort of the user facing um, portion, um, user, being meant in terms of both um, uh, uh, patrons as well as uh, administrative or curatorial users or, or internal administrative uh, or managerial users. Um, so this is certainly things like UI, CLIs, APIs, uh, and, and, and things of that ilk. Uh, below that, there is a, a level component a level of component tree we're calling the registry. Um, which is dealing with the persistence of state um, information. Essentially, this is going to be the metadata store. Um, both it's going to be dealing with state of the preserved content, uh, the state of the system itself, um, and the, you know, the configured state of the system itself, as well as the operational log uh, of, of the system as, as, is, as, is, as it is in action. Below that, there's a level we're calling the propter. Uh, one of the things that we're putting forth in this reference model uh, is, a, is a mode of operation 
um, where there is a very, very high level of automated uh, policy-driven activity. We are, we are trying to uh, embody um, human um, uh, decision-making, uh, human knowledge in a machine actionable way in terms of you know, policy rules. Uh, and then that then views the overall repository as a finite state machine. Given the current state, given some sort of stimulus, whether it's generated by a user request or it's self um, identified by the system itself being self-reflective, um, it'll invoke an appropriate set of policy rules uh, that in turn is going to um, invoke uh, potentially a chain of microservices that are living down in this layer we're calling the mill uh, in homage to, to Babbage a little bit there um, that are intended to bring the system back into conformance with the state of policy. Um, again, at this first phase, we're not sure how that might be do doable, if it's doable at all. Although the, this kind of policy-based enforcement, this is something that the IROD system has had in place uh, to a certain extent for some time. I think this is also the one of the end goals of the Preservation Action, uh, Action Re Registry Initiative. So I think there, there are glimmerings of how this might happen. Uh, the mill, as I said, is sort of a, a, a farm of uh, hopefully a ever evolving set of microservices doing useful things, communicating via asynchronous messaging. Uh, and then at the bottom layer, there is um, uh, the store storage uh, layer uh, that is dealing with the persistence of you know, the manifestation of the content itself. So uh, a couple of things to mention here, a uh, little bit more detail. Um, that the contours of the reference model are intended to uh, help to ensure a very, very high level of fault tolerance. Um, primarily, we assume through um, asynchronous operation uh, that is going to lead to, you know, eventual consistency within the system itself. Um, high level of performance through, you know, uh, an adaptable series of microservices um, that can be spun up or down to um, uh, respond to, to demand. Um, uh, both design and implementation and operational flexibility through the separation of concerns, um, that there's that everything is working through sort of this asynchronous message passing uh, when, and, and, and via APIs. So everything can be on its own maintenance pattern. We can, we can add things, we can take things away and so forth. Um, that we're going to get high levels of productivity through that kind of pro policy-driven automation that I mentioned. Uh, and another thing that we'd like to, uh, again, is emphasize is we'd like to be able to um, maximize enhancement of the system through reconfiguration, not through recoding. Uh, now, of course, some things you're going to have to code, uh, but um, uh, there's other things that we hope, you know, adding support for a new format or a new content genre ideally would not require a whole lot of coding. Uh, but there should be, you know, uh, machine actionable languages for expressing those things uh, that can, you know, that the that the software could use as basically a, 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 a generalized engine and just adapt itself in that regard. Um, I mentioned we're also dealing with a um, information abstract information reference model. Uh, this is not quite as fully fleshed out as some of the other things we're doing. And, and again, there's a there's a whole lot here. Uh, the main um, modeling hierarchy is in this middle column. Uh, we're, we are going with a four-level hierarchy, not sort of a, a two or three-level one that is most uh, is often seen in, in contemporary products. So there are objects made up of representations, made up of files, uh, made up potentially made up of bit streams. Um, that's sort of somewhat of an optional level that is in there primarily to allow us to do something useful with um, container. Uh, container files. Um, that notion of representation, this is something that has been built into the premise information model for quite some time. A representation is a is a useful uh, grouping of files that are serving some um, important informational uh, purpose. On the left-hand side, there is sort of a parallel uh, hierarchy of abstract entities that are defined primarily just to um, introduce series of um, useful heritable uh, properties. 
um, the, the root entity is um, a, a thing, uh, which can be anything. Everything here is a thing. Uh, and a thing has a couple of characteristic properties of uh, its essential type, its purposive role, its informative function, and its expressive form. Uh, and there are going to be controlled vocabularies for all those things that are be, being defined appropriate to the various levels of objects are going to have a different set of vocabulary terms for representations and files and so forth. Um, the referable entity is in there to, um, um, to deal with questions of status, um, whether something is active or deleted, logically deleted or physically purged. Um, there's also a notion of a link count um, at the referable level, and that is in there so that we want to be able to compose, uh, you know, complex objects um, can be composed uh, or re complex representations can be composed through either direct um, uh, physical inclusion, you know, by value or by reference. Uh, and once you introduce, um, uh, you know, inclusion by reference, you need to have a notion of a link count because you don't want to delete something that something else is depending upon. Um, some, you know, referables uh, can be encoded uh, in terms of compression or encryption, uh, and then those encodings can take the form of, um, you know, tangible manifestations that have size, format, and potentially, you know, uh, a, a characteristic digest, uh, and so forth. So, a um, couple of the high-level things to um, talk about here. We're distinguishing between objects and works, where a work is essentially a subtype of an object uh, that is that is multi-part. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, a serial article might be a singular object, um, but that article may exist in the context of a multi-part um, issue, which itself might be part of a multi-part uh, volume, uh, which might be part of a multi-part uh, title or, or, or serial run. Um, objects themselves um, make a fundamental distinction between whether they're, they're content or system objects. Content object is something that's that's basically a you know a, a cura of curatorial interest. It's something that typically is going to be um, uh, contributed from an from a curator or derived from from that initial contribution. Uh, system objects represent various um, uh, operational entities of the system itself. Um, all these things get represented as objects because we want to um, we want to provide them with persistence. Their state is going to be persisted at the at the registry layer, uh, and their manifestation is going to get persisted at the store layer. So basically, essentially, you can think of this you know as all metadata, um, whether it's uh, for for content or metadata for the system, is um, eventually going to get uh, written out to to um, to to the file store. Um, so for purposes of disaster recovery, we want to be able to recover the whole thing from its file system, well, metaphorically from its file system or object store uh, representation. Um, you also would have seen that we're drawing a distinction between what we're calling representations and presentations at that middle layer. Uh, this isn't also is not quite worked out, but we are, we're basically following the distinction that you find in METS, for example, between the physical structure represented by a METS file set and uh, a logical structure uh, represented by the struct map. Um, so again, this is a way of sort of distinguishing between the, um, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the static structural arrangement of a thing and sort of the, the behavioral navigation of that thing, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, its, its performance. Uh, at representations themselves um, can be either digital or tangible. Um, so we, we want to be able to support both born digital uh, and dig digitization workflows. And in the digitization case, um, it is very useful to have a way to talk about the, the tangible thing uh, that isn't in the repository per se uh, as itself. It's, it's only in there by descriptive metadata. But it's important to have be able to, to deal with that. Uh, we're also distinguishing between substantive, descriptive, and instrumental representations. The substantive uh, representation is sort of the, the core content, content value. You know, it's the thing, it's the text, it's the sound, uh, it's the image. 
uh, descriptive is, is just that. Essentially, it's the metadata. It's telling you something about the substance. Uh, and an instrumental representation is a way of, of uh, uh, capturing um, information that is necessary for the, for the proper performance of that substance. So if you have a, uh, an audio playlist, for example, uh, it's not primarily substantive uh, in the same sense as the individual audio files, but it's necessary to, um, to have the proper performance of the thing. Similarly, for, for, a, for a, um, uh, an image performance, uh, still image performance, you might have um, a color profile you know, that is serving a very instrumental ends. Um, at the data level, we're drawing a distinction between, you know, primary data and again, descriptive metadata, uh, and also between sort of singular objects, singular files that are whole and completed in of, of themselves, uh, wrapper files that have a, a very important um, uh, internal, internal structure, uh, and container files that generally can be uh, arbitrary uh, aggregations of stuff. So uh, getting here towards the end, um, where are we in all this? Um, so again, we are coming towards the end of the first phase of activity, um, which started out, of course, with um, um, staffing up the project. Uh, we spent a lot of time early on in uh, talking about um, behavioral norms and operational best practices. We spent uh, a good six months in a variety of stakeholder engagement exercises. Um, uh, there's been some very uh, uh, wide ranging um, uh, survey instruments that have gone out online surveys. Uh, we have been constituting a series of more focused, um, well, fo focus groups uh, dealing on specific issues um, and so forth. Uh, and from these, we've been extracting user stories and formalizing in terms of use cases. And we're right now uh, still underway is, is uh, using those use cases to develop um, our requirements that eventually is going to be turned into an RFP tender. Um, still to come is um, evaluating the proposals that come back, making that crucial build by integrate decision. And then, of course, just the simple task of making it all happen. So I think that brings me to the end. So uh, I'll Thanks, stop Stephen. talking here now. And I am sure there's lots you want to say. Well done. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Stephen. Let me, let me stop. I find it easier to talk to a face than a screen. All right, well, we definitely want to um, open up the floor to any questions that folks have for Stephen. Please feel free to unmute yourself or add a uh, question in the chat and we'll read it back. Wow. Stephen, how much time? Uh, when did you say the project started? Uh, project started um, last last uh, well, July, August of last year. Thank so you. we're we're coming up on the first year anniversary. And I recognize that that here, you know, I I had the privilege. Of, of that that kind of time, um, which you know, I you know many many other institutions may not quite have that. Uh, so I'm I'm very happy that I had that privilege. But uh, uh, okay, Nathan. Okay, thank you. I'm glad Nathan you found that interesting. Uh, as we found. Some of your work on uh, and talking about um, infrastructure and a couple of your recent publications, which you'll you'll see at iPress, is you know we're uh, we're reciting uh, and it, we found it very useful. Your your whole idea of you know the modern the modern preservation distributed preservation infrastructure um, was um, uh, was something that we've you know taken on uh, quite heavily.
I have a question. Hi, Stephen. This is Doug Garhoff from NYU Libraries. I appreciated the um, differentiation you made between um, presenting the uh, the content. Let's just simplify all of the language of the one slide. Presenting yeah. the content versus um, something that we might get um, you know, more comfort from, which is preserving the bits and bytes and the objects themselves. So I am thinking about a charge that we have in my group at NYU Libraries, which is um, to also provide digital preservation for our institutional repositories. And that includes our new data repository. I'm thinking about the kind of things either that um, uh, researchers are depositing that we don't know much about, um, certainly for things that are curated that are in our data repository, we have some guidance that we provide in terms of how they might um, organize things, but there's a whole lot of other stuff over the years that we have acquired through our institutional repository. And I don't know where we would get information about what it is that we are preserving. So we hang our hat in a sense on, you know, reproducing the files, the bits, the bytes. And I just wonder in your um, constellation of activities, do you, I'm sure with Born Digital things, um, either from your repository or your curators, how do you take into account the things for which we don't know? Um, a lot about their ultimate <laughs> performance. I, I'm, I'm just wondering how does that factor yeah. in? And I hope I um, explain that well yeah. enough or broadly enough. Uh, no, I think so. I think that that is a that is something that 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 all of us are struggling with, and and I think we're 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 going to continue to struggle. I mean, there there is no final answer to that whatsoever. Uh, like yourselves, uh, we do integrate with our. Um, uh, institutional repository in in our data repository. Um, the I, uh, the IR is primarily um, used to comply with our um, open access um, university open access policy. So that doesn't bother me quite so much. Um, you know, it's it's a lot. It's mostly text. Um, although we're we're starting to see some additional you know, supplemental materials, but again, that's mostly. Uh, sound and moving image, um, and so th things of that sort. So, uh, which isn't to say it may not get really, really complicated in the future. Um, the data side, uh, again, it hasn't presented a, an enormous problem so far, because um, what we've been seeing through that channel has been primarily arising in the social sciences, um, which is mostly you know tabular numeric data. So. You know, it's a spreadsheet for the most part, um, and you know, there that that's that is certainly would not be considered one of our highest at risk uh, genres or, or, or formats. Um, but you know, the, what the key the key point is is you don't know what what are we going to get tomorrow. You know, someone's going to put in something into the into the IR that's going to be really really weird. Uh, you know, an immersive, you know, an immersive environment. You know, someone's going to put you know the you know. A physicist is going to put some sort of strange, you know, simulation that's going to be tied to a particular piece of highly customized software, no doubt. Um, so there's a couple things that sort of that we try to do. Um, again, we are really, really lucky that we have um, very deep curatorial expertise in most of these areas, and we are in constant contact with them to make sure that we understand what this stuff is. Um, uh, we do um, we do have the opportunities to create um, derivatives at various points in the process. Um, hopefully, to make sure that in addition to the na native form, we'll have alternative forms that might be more inherently preservable, uh, at least in the near term. Um, we are going to be starting uh, up a, a much more active investigation of um, emulation capabilities. Uh, we have been involved with uh, Yale's uh, Easy um, project for quite some time. We've had a couple of small-scale pilots. Uh, we want to sort of turn that into a much more of a production-oriented um, system. Um, so we want to start actually collecting software um, to the extent that we can. 
uh, just for that kind of purpose. Uh, and finally, um, particularly with regard to the information model that I just went through, um, you know, we want to provide the, the widest possible opportunity for the richest possible description of the stuff we get, uh, knowing that even if we can't do something with it, you know, the more we know about it, the more we're going to be able to enable, you know, future activity, even if it is the last resort, it's going to be, you know, a digital archaeological archeo activity. Um, so, I mean, we know we're not going to get fully rich metadata about everything, uh, but we want, we would not want to have to be in position of throwing out anything that we might be able to know or glean, even if there's no immediate use for it. So uh, no magic panacea, I'm afraid, um, but that, that isn't to say that there are not, you know, useful, tangible things that I think we all can do. Uh, and information sharing, of course, is, is the other. I should have mentioned that right up right up front. You know, no one's ever going to know everything about everything. Um, but, you know, someone probably knows something about everything. Uh, and if we can pool and share that in a really uh, useful way, then um, that's that's to the benefit of all of us. Other questions for Stephen? So I, I have um, uh, one question for you, Stephen, with regard to um, you know kind of the stages of where you are right now and where you're moving forward. Uh, that last slide. So you you know eventually, uh, it's one of the subsequent steps you mentioned: a build versus buy decision and. A lot of this, I imagine a lot of this research that and the, the, the procedures of process you're going through right now, the thought processes are also lending themselves to uh, or as input to build versus buy. And in the past, it was all build. And now, you know, there's obviously the um, the, the notion and, and, and motivation to perhaps buy some of this or integrate with something. Um, can you comment on, you know, where some of those thoughts might be leading you or is it too early to really kind of think yeah. that much about build versus buy at this point? Um, we're, we're been trying not to, um, because yeah, yeah. You know, once you start down that road, that that that's biasing everything else that you do, because you're always going to say, well, how am I going to do this? And again, as I say, at this point, I, I'm always the one in the, in, in the meeting encouraging people to, to, you know, no, no, you know, you're making an assumption there about, you know, based on what we currently do or what you've currently seen something else do. And that's that's not appropriate at this point. We'll get to there soon enough and we'll have we'll have that argument uh, you know at the right time. Um, whatever we do, it is certainly not going to be a full build. You know, that's just that's just it it it, it couldn't happen. We don't we don't have, you know, no one has, <laughs> you know, no one in the institution I think has has the ability to do that. Um, any build that we do would be tinkering around the edges. Um, you know, if there is important uh, added value uh, function um, that we think we can, that we absolutely need that we can't find, or if we think that there is an opportunity that we have some, you know, unique insight to create something useful that would otherwise not come into being soon or, or on the right time frame, then we'll try to do that. Um, so we're almost certainly looking at, at, at buying or lease, you know, whatever, but, you know, buy in the, in the generic sense. Um, we are open at this point. Um, we don't know whether we're going to be able to find a single solution that, that handles everything that we want, uh, or if we're going to have to sort of piece something together uh, in an integrative fashion. Um, obviously, pluses and minuses to both those things. Uh, you know, a monolithic thing, you there's one, one, you know, you know who to call when something happens. Uh, um, on the con side, it's probably going to have strengths and weaknesses. Everything does. Um, on the integration side, you know, you can you can pull together much more of a best of breed kind of you know global system, but at the expense of complexity uh, and having to worry about you know, integration issues uh, and and distributed maintenance and things like that. So uh, again, we're once we have the requirements in the RFP, we'll be putting it out. Um, uh, vendors, and we're going we're to be talking with you know community open source communities 
um, they're going to be encouraged to respond either saying they can do it all or they can do this little piece really really well we want to we want to we want to hear back from both of those things and then we'll make we'll make the we'll make we'll do the evaluation and, and decide what's the most practical and expeditious way to move forward I think Nathan also had a question in chat. Oh, um, okay. Um, it's operational. How many dedicated FDUs exactly working on? Uh, working on it, uh, Nathan, from the operational point of view or working on it from the maintenance enhancement point of view? Both, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> um, uh, gosh, kind of hard to say at this point uh, since we don't know what 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 we're what we're looking at. What's what's actually reasonable? Um, operationally, um, you know, I don't think it's I don't think the, it's going to have a significantly large. Should I, we wouldn't anticipate having a, a a larger operational footprint than than we currently have, um, which is you know, uh, gosh, how many people involved? Uh, well, it's hard. You know, it's hard to tell because it, it, you know, it's everyone is. It's not it's not full time for anyone. Everyone's having pieces of time. Um, on the on you know on the on the on the development side, um, again, it depends on on what kind of solution we go with. Um, you know, if it's fully vended, then then our responsibility is just to prod the vendor, you know, and say, here, we'd like you to do this, we'd like you to do that. You know, how can we help you do that? But we, you know, we'd like you to do that. And and that would certainly um have much a lower uh, call on our own internal resources. Uh, if we're integrating things together, of course, then you know that level of, of internal oversight becomes uh, more significant. So I, I wish I had a better answer. Uh, hopefully, by the you know towards the end of the second phase, we I will be able to answer that. So uh, uh, we'll come back to that, Nathan, at some some future point. Um, from Linda, she mentioned it's great you're receiving institutional support for this. Congratulations. Will this include building out Harvard's internal technology infrastructure to support the storage? Yeah. Um, so for the past two years now, uh, we, we well, two years ago, we, we went through uh, a big project to um, put into place a very explicit uh, decoupling of the repository application layer from the storage layer. Um, this is an aid of a much longer term vision we have of seeing library storage uh, writ large as, as an orthogonal service function to little, you know, all sorts of library vertical applications um, that can, you know, but there's sort of a single uh, storage fabric, so to speak, uh, and that various systems can look at appropriate subsets of that and data can sort of, we're trying to get away from always having to move something from A to B every time we want to go from system, you know, X to Y. Um, you know, every time you move it, you there's always the possibility you're going to drop it on the floor and whatnot. So um, things should live where they most naturally should live. Uh, and then things that need to talk you need to be able to see or write to those things should be able to do so. Um, so um, when we did this, we went from our older operational model of um, physically pro procuring uh, hardware and installing it in you know, university data centers and managing it and doing all that. Uh, we are now leasing all of our storage capacity from both internal and external um, uh, you know, providers. Uh, internal to the university, uh, we're basically leasing capacity from um, the university's uh, research computing um, group, IT group, um, which you know buys and operates things on a scale even you know significantly bigger than we are because they are supporting all those high energy physicists and so forth and astronomers. Um, we're releasing from them. Um, we are making use of some regional. Um, uh, storage consortia up here in the Northeast or something called the, the, New, the, the Northeast Storage Exchange, uh, which is an academic consortium um, uh, that we're using their um, 
near uh, near line tape um, uh, tape uh, capabilities. Uh, we're dealing with some uh, commercial um, <clears throat> vendors. Uh, we have some stuff in uh, Amazon Deep Archive um, as sort of our you know not strictly speaking you know uh, uh, offline, but 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 near enough you know uh, inexpensive um, high density storage. Uh, we're also working with um, Wasabi uh, for our uh, high performance, uh, you know, supporting our high performance delivery uh, applications. Um, if we can get away with it, we'd like to keep all of our stuff where it already is and just layer the preservation, the repository on top of it. We don't want to again have to have to move stuff. It's it's a lot. It takes a long time. Um, and but we do now have the flexibility to sort of add add things sort of on the fly. Basically, we can talk to anything that supports uh, the S3 API. Um, we can interface directly with, uh, and we are making use of um, a storage uh, orchestration software. We're using Starfish, um, which is helping us, you know, which is doing policy driven replication. So, based on a, a file level. Uh, curatorial designation of of the file's role, uh, Starfish will automatically ensure that there are as many copies as are supposed to be, and those copies are all in the right place, uh, and that those copies are all in sync with each other. So, we would like to sort of continue, certainly continue um, that sort of functional capability, um, and maybe that that existing operational footprint. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. Um, thanks so much, Stephen, for presenting and for answering all those questions. It's been a great discussion. Um, we are about a minute before the top of the hour, so um, I think I'd like to go ahead and try to wrap things up. Um, so it's great to see everyone here. Um, thanks again, Stephen. And we are planning our next meeting for September 12th. 